It's a simple substance that's literally become the building block of our civilization. We pour it, mold it, now we can even bend it. The main component of everything from roads and runways to buildings and bridges. Now, concrete on Modern Marvels. We see concrete every day. We walk on concrete sidewalks. We drive on concrete freeways. We work in concrete buildings. It's everywhere, so much so that we too often overlook it. When people think of concrete as the gray stuff, the sidewalks we skin our knees on, the, that material we sneak our handprints into. <laughs> but truly, concrete's an exciting material. We use concrete more than any other man-made material on the planet. And water is the only substance on Earth that we utilize more. We pour it to create the foundations of our great cities. Without it, steel and glass giants would never be able to scrape the sky. We form it into infinite shapes and sizes, from humble building blocks to colossal, awe-inspiring support columns. And although we often view it as a drab, utilitarian building material, we've crafted it into some of the world's most breathtaking structures. Well, concrete is the most universal building material because it goes to the end user in a plastic state or in a wet state, which gives them the ability to form it, mold it in whatever shape they want. So the possibilities are endless what they can do with concrete. We produce over six billion tons of concrete each year. That's an amount equal to nearly one ton for each and every one of us on the planet. And just think, with over 55,000 miles of concrete freeways and highways in the United States, and countless miles of sidewalks, it paves our paths home. So what exactly is this extraordinary substance that has cemented itself so solidly into our lives? Well, concrete is a composite material. It's an artificial stone, and it is made of sand stone, water, and cement. The most essential of these components is the cement. There's a saying in the concrete industry that cement is to concrete as flour is to cake. It's the glue that holds the rock and the sand together. If you didn't have cement, you'd have a bunch of rock and sand and water, and it would just, you'd have a pile of nothing. If concrete's starting point is cement, cements is the limestone quarry. To make cement, all you need is limestone, clay, and sand. These ingredients are crushed and combined into a powder that's poured into a kiln, the heart of the cement-making process. Burning fuel inside the massive cylindrical spinning kilns heats the mixture to a blazing temperature of 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. The mixture becomes partially molten, forming a new marble-sized component called clinker. Once cooled, machines grind the clinker into the superfine powder that we know as cement. When combined with water, sand, and stone, you get concrete. Once the cement and the water come in contact with each other, hydration begins, causing the cement to expand little arms that go out and they start grabbing onto each other. And after they start grabbing onto each other, a gel forms similar as glue, which then hardens and glues all of the other components together. This humble manufactured rock powers a $35 billion industry, employing over 2 million workers in the United States alone. Truck driver Dave Robinson is one of them. He's been delivering concrete to construction sites for over 25 years. On a typical day, I'll probably do four, maybe five loads. I, I like jobs where I can just run, run, run. I don't like sitting around anywhere. Once Dave pours his load, he's back on the road ready to pick up another batch at the concrete plant. We load the load in about three minutes, and you head out for whatever job you're going to, and hopefully you can be there on the way back in less than 90 minutes. In Dave's job, speed is of the essence. The miracle of concrete occurs when the wet stuff hardens, but it's a huge headache if it happens before you're ready. I've had jobs where uh, trucks broken down. It takes three days to chip the drum out. 
we're gonna pull onto the plant and spot the truck so we can load the truck with the concrete and make sure we've got it lined up properly. If you've ever wondered where those massive amounts of concrete you've seen unloaded at construction sites come from, it's right here at the concrete batch plant. Here we are at the uh, control room of the uh, batch plant here in Irwindale. And uh, as you can see behind me, there's computer screens up. In our business nowadays, everything's done by computer. The batch man at the plant is like a baker, armed with a recipe, standing ready to artfully combine his ingredients. Topping his list is the all-important cement. Every day, a fleet of cement trucks delivers this crucial ingredient to the concrete plant. Don't make the error that so many do and mistake a cement truck like this one for a concrete truck. There is a difference. Now this bolt truck that comes in and hooks up to these pipes and blows that up, now he's a cement truck. He's blowing the product cement up into the silos. But once we take it out of the silo, mix it with the rock, sand, cement, and water together, now you've got concrete. So now it's changed names. Now that the batch man has his cement, he needs another crucial ingredient to make his concrete a mixture of rock and sand, referred to as aggregate. By volume, the aggregate dominates the recipe, comprising up to three quarters of the final concrete mixture. It hitches a ride on a conveyor belt from a quarry next door to the concrete plant. Well, here we are in the uh, aggregate overhead scale area of the batch plant. What happens here is the rock and sand come up the belts, they go into the overhead. That's where they're stored until we pull a batch of concrete. Now that we've got our aggregate and cement, all we need is water, but not so fast. Just like you can add ingredients to spice up a cake, today's batch plants can produce a wide array of designer concretes by throwing in special additives. We have retarders, which slow the concrete down, allows us more time. We have what's called super plasticizers. They make the concrete very wet with chemical rather than water. Also, we have now uh, uh, liquid colors that we use in the concrete. In the past, you could have any color of concrete that you wanted, as long as it was gray. But today, the options are practically limitless. This new liquid color system is much like a paint system at maybe Home Depot or Lowe's, where you can go in and match colors. And we have preset formulas in there for different colors coming off the color chart. We can also match competitors' colors whenever we want to, just exactly like a paint machine. With our colors chosen and all ingredients in place, we're finally ready. Let's make some concrete. When the batch man hits a button to start a batch of concrete, there's quite a few things that happen simultaneously. The rock, the sand goes up the belt into the holding hopper. The cement gate opens. It fills the scale with the amount of cement that's needed for that particular load. Water goes from the holding hopper into the water scale. Add mixtures are pulled and everything goes into the truck and uh, the batch is complete and he's on his way to the job. Now the concrete truck takes over, mixing the ingredients in its rotating drum with the help of spiral shaped fins mounted inside. Now it's time for Dave's truck to be loaded. During Dave's career, he's seen this speedy process repeat itself thousands of times. Load of concrete is approximately 4,000 pounds a yard, give or take a little bit, depending on the mix. And uh, the total load is about 40,000. They are loaded. And just like that, Dave rides off to deliver his load at the next job site. The idea of using substances to hold building materials together dates back to antiquity. But concrete in its truest sense, as a building block in its own right, was really an innovation of the Roman Empire. Roman concrete was a lot like ours. It consisted of aggregate, water, and a cement-like substance comprised of lime and volcanic ash, or pozzolan. The Romans initially used the formula not as a building block, but as a mortar in their stone and brick structures. The volcanic ash set their mortar apart from all the rest because it enabled their mortar to harden underwater, 
it was only in the ash of the volcanoes that developed the Roman concrete. It is a very fine dust, which is good for the concrete because you got a lot of surface area to it. And so when they took the possum and mixed it up, holy moly, all of a sudden they get a real material that'll set hard underwater. Using this innovative mortar, Roman builders were able to construct their vast system of aqueducts. But they didn't stop there. The Romans discovered they could mix their mortar with stones, bricks, and other materials to produce concrete. They did this by pouring pieces of brick and stone into a mold and filling it with their mortar to bind the materials together. They could make molds into virtually any shape, enabling them to build previously unimaginable structures, like the dome of the Pantheon. The Pantheon is a building that is a round building. It's 100 feet high. It has a, a dome of 143 feet in diameter. Now, that's a big building for any engineer to look at. How did they accomplish this? This was a huge open space with a single domed uh, closing on the top. And yet, that was 2,000 years ago. Well, the Roman engineering really developed quite a bit in the highway, in the water transportation, and in the materials area. They learned very specifically how to handle concrete. While impressive works of Roman architecture still exist today, the knowledge that made them possible vanished when the empire collapsed. The quality control features of making concrete was forgotten. That's as simple as it was. They lost the recipe on to control the quality of their product. Well over a thousand years passed before various experimenters rediscovered a cement that could harden underwater. It became known as hydraulic cement. By the early 19th century, American engineers started to use hydraulic cement in ambitious civil engineering projects, New York's Erie Canal. The Erie Canal has seemed to me to be a real starting point because before that, the concrete mixture was not very good. Construction of the vast transportation waterway began in 1817, stretching for 360 miles the canal once contained more than 80 changes in elevation, called lifts. Well, these lifts required structures, and the structures required hydraulic lime to put them together. So there was a demand, and, and it just so happens that they found a natural cement that could be heated. Erie Canal engineer Canvas White experimented with different kinds of rock near the canal before he found one that formed a natural hydraulic cement. The impermeable mortar produced with the cement worked ideally. Almost two centuries after the canal opened, traces of the mortar can still be seen in what remains of the original waterway. But the formula for the cement we generally use today is credited to an English mason, Joseph Aspton. In 1824, he patented a manufactured hydraulic cement that was far superior to the natural cement used to construct the Erie Canal and other projects. His claim to fame is that he patented the process that these other people had been doing for the last 50 years. Aspton called the substance Portland cement. The reason why it got its name is because once it was hardened, it resembled the limestone quarry in the Isle of Portland, which is in the English Channel. In decades to come, concrete manufacturers using Portland cement would establish a mighty industry and revolutionize construction. The word concrete comes from the Latin concretus, meaning grown together or compounded. Concrete will return on Modern Marvels. All of us have internal plumbing. But for some of us with frequent bladder urges, doing errands also means knowing where all the bathrooms are along the way. The worry your pipes might leak means you don't always detour from your route. But you can take another direction. Talk to your doctor about how to take care with Vesicare. Vesicare, once a day, can reduce urges and may help effectively manage bladder leakage day and night. 
If you have certain types of stomach, urinary, or glaucoma problems, do not take Vesicare. While taking Vesicare, if you experience a serious allergic reaction, severe abdominal pain, or become constipated for three or more days, tell your doctor right away. Common side effects are dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, and indigestion. A chance to follow a whim, not always your urges. It's not just a pipe dream. Ask your doctor today if Vesicare is right for you. If you owe taxes or are facing an IRS lien or wage garnishment, here's important news for you. Now there's a new program that will immediately end wage garnishments, remove IRS liens, and eliminate IRS tax penalties. Call right now to enroll in the Rapid Relief Program from Advantage Tax Resolution.